we are living in a moment of massive transformation for intelligence operations around the world. No longer are the most vital and important details hidden behind a curtain of security clearances and closed networks. In our last episode, we discussed the capabilities of open source intelligence and how OSINT analysts can leverage investigative skills to unravel ground truth in almost every scenario. This episode takes us a leap further into the realm of OSINT. We're joined by a special guest today whose exploits with publicly available information have shown a stark light on the grimmest war of our lifetimes. He has applied his knowledge and skill to enlighten millions of people around the world about the war in Ukraine. And he has leveraged the virality of Twitter to enlighten the world on Russian war crimes, illuminate us on the current status of the front lines, and share crucial information about the realities of the war. War is no longer a distant aberration. It is accessible at your fingertips. This is modern warfare, fought in the open for all to see, for all those who dare to look. My guest today is OSINT Technical. His Twitter following of over 700,000 people provides some evidence to the value and quality of the information he's sharing. He has chosen to remain anonymous for reasons we reveal during the podcast. In this episode, we discuss the origin of OSINT Technical, the ethics of providing open source intelligence, the status of the Russian military, the social psychology of the Russian population, modern military technology that is turning the tides of war in Ukraine, and a prediction of how the war will end. My name is Nick. This is the NDS Show. Enjoy OSINT Technical. Hey, welcome to the podcast. So yeah, I was hoping you could give me a quick rundown on how you got started with this OSINT Technical account. Yeah, so really OSINT Technical is more an amalgamation of some of the stuff that I've been doing for a while now. Um, I probably started doing open source intelligence when I was probably before high school at this point, um, following uh, the rise of, or at least the the beginning of Arab Spring moving into um, the Syrian civil war, I would say is this first real environment where the social media driven conflict really started to be observable to the just general person, just looking on Facebook or Twitter or any other platform. Um, moving into the Syrian civil war, which of course was an extension of the Arab Spring, um, that was an environment where there was both the regular internet infrastructure across Syria. Syria was a relatively well-developed country at the time. Um, and this combination of a, a very large conflict, um, which kind of allowed everyday people just with an interest in it to easily peer into the conflict itself and get really actionable inter information out of it. Um, Elliot Higgins, back when he was doing his early work, um, mm -hmm. uh, he was also under a similar pseudonymous um, identity as, um, as Brown Moses, um, looking into uh, a lot of uh, war crimes in Syria and also some of the conflict events. Um, and so I was following him at the time, kind of doing some, you know, just parallel individual research while I was in high school. Um, I eventually discovered the wonderful website Live UA Map, um, which was both mm -hmm. focused in on Ukrainian stuff and also they originally started with Ukraine, of course, UA Map, um, moving down and also looking at the Middle East, Syrian civil war, rise of ISIL, um, and sort of that developed conflict. And so I was, you know, I was sitting in my high school um, computer class where I, I really didn't do much actual work for the class. I was, you know, I was, I was stuck on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I was stuck on live UA map. I was stuck on all these things, you know, basically just doing my own thing in the corner. Um, and so that, that really evolved into a lot of the stuff that I did for OSINT technical, which was just, you know, geolocation, um, identifying, uh, uh, one of the early projects I, I worked on actually in the account, if anyone wants to really dig back to those early tweets was wildfire mapping. Um, was utilizing early, oh, nice. you know, firms data, which, you know, we're all using that for mm -hmm. Ukraine now, but I was using that, you know, good, uh, four years ago um, to, to actually dig into um, some of the uh, uh, wildfires in California and across the West. Um, 
And so really a lot of what I've done has been these slow, steady, incremental steps, you know, acquiring information and learning how to disseminate it. Um, and, and, you know, I'll say that to everyone, you have to have, you don't necessarily have to have a perfect base to disseminate, you know, information out and talk with other people, but really a lot of what OSINT is built on is people teaching others how to do things. And so reaching out to people, talking to people, and usually in the OSIN community, as I found, as I was, you know, coming up in it, people really love to talk to other people about what they're doing, you know, what their techniques are. Of course, it's the open source nature of what we're doing. It's, it's this sort of information sharing, but also sharing how you got to your conclusion, because you can, because it's all open source. And I, and I think, I think that's a great asset um to the OSINT community because if you look at the intelligence uh space in the intelligence community there's not well you know there's obviously communication happening across agencies and things like that in the united states there's definitely a little bit of hey this is my ball i'm taking this home <laughs> you know there's a little bit of that going on in the intelligence community um well you know if people are looking on youtube you can see this guy singing on an elephant uh so i was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, what's up with the elephant? Yeah, so I honestly, I kind of do not remember why I chose this profile picture. Um, okay. What I do remember is the process of of once I was kind of gaining some traction on Twitter, having a panicked moment of um, trying to figure out whether or not it was copyrighted, <laughs> which right. which was an interesting um, interesting dig. So you know, of course, I, I took my my OSINT know how and I said I'm going to find out if this is a copyrighted image. Um, and I started to dig. And of course, the, the first place I actually um, came across this was in the Library of Congress. Um, and wow. it turns out that this is a, a fairly old image once I actually chased down the chain of custody um, belonging to the Marine Corps um, from probably 1917 to 1921, not specifically dated. Um, I ended up going down to the Library of Congress and talking with a couple of the archivists there. Um, they couldn't find me the original plate or anything, but they could help me with, you know, identifying a bit of extra information about where it came from, um, utilizing some resources that they had access to, to, you know, kind of gain an idea of what the chain of custody looked like for the image. And, you know, I, I came across at least what was most likely the unit responsible who'd been deployed. It was a Marine unit um, mm -hmm. that was, that was um, de deployed both, um, expeditionarily to um to africa and to southeast asia um during that period of time and it, it you know digging digging that up and coming across sort of this backing information um was really interesting and, and of course this was the first time i think i had ever been exposed to some of the more really unique resources that you know the government sometimes offers honestly i did not realize that the library of congress that you could just like go there and you could go to the national archives and say hey yeah. can someone help me you know find this image um and you can just walk in you know make, well i mean post covid it was make an appointment um but you know these these resources are out there and it's just one of it, it's another thing that goes back to the osint of you know just digging around and finding resources is is amazing so i'm, I'm no military expert or warfare expert i never claim to be but I don't see that that working, you know, firing this <laughs> this heavy machine gun from you the know, back of an I mean, elephant. The history of war elephants it, it, it is it is it is an ancient theory, um, and and who knows? I I knowing the Marines that I know, I absolutely understand why they tried this in the first place. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know they they might have made it work. Yeah, Marines will try anything, right? Uh, very cool. Well, I was hoping that you'd have some deep-seated thought and um, reason for choosing this image, like you know, it it represented the something X Y Z. But that's okay. That's okay. No, it's it's a cool nah, image, it and obviously, cool. <laughs> it, it looked cool is good enough um, for most people. So let's see your your Twitter. Let's see you're up to let's see seven hundred and five thousand followers. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're definitely interested in open source intelligence. Uh, definitely follow OSINT Technical on Twitter so that he can get that number. We got to get him up to a million. We got to get him up to a million here soon. <laughs> sometime um, soon. <laughs> <laughs> sometime very soon. Um, so let's hope maybe you could talk about that. Just, you know, what's it been like to to grow an account um, up to that number? I mean, 705,000. That's, that's insane. Was it all from the Ukraine stuff that you've been posting? 
Um, no, so actually, uh, yeah. before the war started, I probably had a nah, probably seventy five thousand um mm -hmm. followers so that was that was based on some of the earlier work that i had done um afghan airlift was a huge huge mm -hmm. event that um allowed us to really flex our muscles on on what we were capable of uh back in 2021 with really a lot of the um more esoteric information sources i'll say ukraine way easier to get information out of than afghanistan um right. especially you know when you're when you're trying to dig into random firefights captured and then posted to Snapchat from, you know, Kandahar um, and then trying to geolocate those. That that was a lot of what we were doing in the months leading up to the airlift. We were actually tracking very steadily the collapse of the Afghan army, the the ANA, mm -hmm. the ANP, um, and frankly, the Afghan government as a whole. Um, we, were, we were able to sort of see this, this unstoppable march of the Taliban and sort of track as they were sort of making their way and establishing control over these local areas. Um, and, and I think a lot of us had seen the Afghan airlift coming. And so we were tracking again, various assets that had been moving around and getting pre-positioned for the airlift out of the, you know, out of the Gulf States. Um, and I, I really think, you know, that was, that was one of the big early things that we did that at least got me some attention. Um, and then, you know, before that, again, the, the average OSINT communicator is, you know, someone not with that many followers. I, I would say having this number of followers is definitely stressful to a degree. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the OSINT work, and I'll say this, some of my best OSINT work was done before I had 10,000 followers. You know, when you're kind of forced to really dive deep into things and, and really think about them before you put them out. Um, and also having less followers does give you the chance to be a bit more exploratory and get into some of the more experimental things without worrying about potentially being wrong. Because the OSINT community, if you're acting in good faith when you're posting something, you're pretty much certainly not going to get any pushback. Um, we're all going to be generally friendly um, when we're developing new systems or, or utilizing new sources. We're not really going to rag on anyone for doing that if they're wrong with something. Um, and so I would say, you know, definitely low follower count doesn't, doesn't really mean low, low quality work, if anything. Right. I was, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how you, how you get to hit that submit button or upload button. Um, maybe the process that you go through to identify, um, what information you want to share. Like what do you just wake up and say, ah, oh, I want to share rockets today. And then you go find rockets or is it, do you let the news kind of come to you? Um, could maybe yeah, I would enlighten us about your process. It's much more responsive um, to ongoing events. Okay. It's, you know, I mean, you can chase down certain subject areas, but it'll, you'll get random stuff posted by individual units. That is the one really interesting thing about Ukraine. Um, most individual Ukrainian army units and frankly, all across mm -hmm. the Ukrainian armed forces um, have social media accounts, whether that be on, Telegram, some are on Twitter, not many are on Twitter, um, a lot are on Facebook, um, and some on TikTok as well. Um, and so a lot of what I do is just digging through those active accounts on those services and seeing, hey, you know, what are they doing today? What's what's the 30th mechanized brigade posting about today? What what did they do? Um, right. and sort of connecting that to the overall overarching events. Um and and at the same time, you know, getting an understanding of, of what's going on. There, there's a lot of content that goes unposted, um, to be honest, that's that's right. coming out of these individual units. So okay, so you're you're sourcing it from uh members of the military on either side, Ukraine or Russia. Is that pretty safe to say? Yeah, well, Russia for the most a bit part, or is it a mix? More of my Russian stuff is filtered mm -hmm. through Russian mill bloggers. That is that is its okay. own information ecosystem. I don't know many individual Russian units, like maybe apart from the Chechens who are their own pile of work over there um, that actually post something from the unit level with unit attribution. Um, most of that is coming from mill bloggers. So there is a level of not governmental filtering necessarily, but of course the mill bloggers are their own self filtering environment. Um, but they do, you know, provide still a, a pretty good stream of information. I think 
probably the funniest example I've ever had with a Russian mill blogger was one that was, you know, doing his tour of uh, of Crimea and, and Southern Ukraine. Um, and continuously was was accidentally revealing the positions of Russian <laughs> troop convoys, supply convoys, and, and various assets across all across Kherson and uh, Mikolaev, um, which you know was definitely super interesting to track that down and say, hey, you know, this is the road that these Russian convoys are taking because you know HIMARS can target them when they're a bit further north. Yeah, that's the number one rule of warfare, right? Don't give away your position on the internet. Yeah, Number don't don't let don't let the you know military influencers go behind mm. the front lines and start taking pictures of things. Um, so one of the I read an article. It was posted by Scientific American about the ethics of open source intelligence, and and it raised some interesting points. Um, and one of those was um, about sharing violent images. Um, I've looked at your Twitter feed. I don't see too much of it other than you know just some some rockets going off and stuff like that. But there are certainly uh, some violent images being shared from OSINT, OSINTers, I should say, um, that have on Twitter have caught me by surprise. I'm like, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to see that right there. Um, but what are your thoughts on just the ethics of kind of sharing that type of information um, via Twitter, via, via the public internet? Yeah, so... That's it, it. It is a really important debate, I think, to have. Um, early in the war, I was sharing a lot more of that, just because the impact of the Russian invasion on Ukrainian civilians was just you couldn't ignore it. It was right. it was so up and center. I mean, following um, you know Ukrainian based accounts like uh, their Ukrainian State Emergency Service. Um, some other reporters and individuals who were who were tracking war crimes as well. Um, Kharkiv uh, was continuously shelled um, by cluster munitions by by Russians firing BM thirty Smirches um, from near the Russian border, basically just into the city of Kharkiv um, for the first week, probably first two weeks of the invasion, before many civilians had had a chance to evacuate. Um, and the effects of that were very expected for for what you would what you would see. Um, with basically shelling a civilian area with cluster munitions. Um, and back then, I really did see the deep importance of sharing that content. These Most social media services offer the opportunity to properly tag and mark this content as sensitive. Right. Um, I think that is important to do. Um and I do think it is really important also to make sure people are seeing, you know, any sort of crimes against humanity with, with these events. I, I think that that was an incredibly important thing, at least um, early on in the invasion when civilian populations were extremely heavily mm -hmm. affected. Um, I, I, you know, it's something that I shared back then. I have no regrets sharing it. Um, right. And I, I really do think it, it, it helped shape the narrative around what was happening and probably will be used in the future um, to, you know, attempt to prosecute individuals who who committed these crimes. And I think establishing sort of a, a public record of that was essential. Um, today, though, it does seem like a large amount of the content, at least the, the super violent content is restricted to a military environment now that doesn't excuse obvious right. war crimes um especially ones committed by wagner units um those there there have been a number committed and i i think at the same time there is the same impetus to share those just just as a record um and and as a communication of what is actually happening um because it is it is an affront to the laws of war um whereas i think some of the other content that's shared that's just gratuitous in nature um from mm -hmm. the front lines you know there there is an argument to be made to share that personally i don't share it because of personal beliefs i have um mm -hmm. related to more direct conventional military engagements where it's clear that the laws of war are being followed and 
necessarily filming that is is a sensitive topic or, or at least sharing footage generated from there um but a lot of that it comes down to personal opinion of the of the originator. I, I do think it is important. It is incredibly necessary to properly track and mark the content um, mm -hmm. that that you're posting and making sure that you aren't just you know throwing out what are effectively you know snuff films onto your you know just feed uncensored or or in a nature where someone could just stumble across it. Um, you know, Twitter early on was a bit better in forcibly marking the content, and that's fallen mm -hmm. off. Um, they used to be a bit more aggressive in making sure that if you didn't self-select, they were going to make sure that there was at least a content warning. They wouldn't censor it. They wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't take it down. Right. They just ensure that that there was there was proper content marking. Um, but that that's that's mostly gone away now. And, and so, it, yeah, it, it is it is definitely a very complex area right now. It's, it's definitely a fine balance. Um, I don't, uh, I'm sure you're tracking the news like everybody about the, the shooter in, in Texas, right? That went up to the mall and was shooting people. Um, I was on Twitter and you know, just randomly, I saw a picture of the guy laying there with blood on the ground, which good riddance, right? I'm glad. I'm glad the guy's done. <laughs> Happy that that guy's dead. But um, I wasn't expecting to see that. I was just kind of like, oh, just using Twitter. Um, so it's definitely, but you're definitely right. I mean, there, it is important to document the truth of what's happening, right? You can't, um, the world isn't perfect, right? We don't live in bubble wrap. Um, this is real raw stuff that is happening. And I think it's important for people to see that, know that and understand that it's real, but at the same time, they should have like some way to opt out of it. If they, maybe, maybe they don't want it in their, their Twitter or something like that. There's gotta be a better way to, to filter that if they. No, I don't feel like looking at dead bodies today, so I can hit the no dead bodies today button. Um, but it's a, it's definitely an interesting ethical question. Um, also, in that article from Scientific America, um, there was an, another one of the ethical considerations they raised was um, the verification of the data. Now, I know we talked a bit beforehand about um, the information you put out. I think it's fantastic. Um, but can you tell me a bit about that, like your, your process for verifying data? Like, are you taking additional steps to perform some type of quality control before you feed it out to the world? Yeah, and, and a lot of people, I, I don't think, realize how much work goes in kind of into the back end to research just individual units responsible for posting content. Yeah. Um, verifying, um, you know, there there is a process of verifying a video before it goes out, like with um you know the the mig 29 combat air patrol video i posted um mm -hmm. yeah, yesterday you know i i did a bunch of work there are there are a few indicators that i personally was looking at you know i know the source that posted it was you know a direct one who who is a pilot um in in the ukrainian air force um you know i can check the vegetation to see that it's you know looking early springish so it, it's probably a recent video you know there's there's a mix there's definitely vegetation but also the fields aren't planted um which is an indicator in, in at least the western part of ukraine that it's spring um you know there's there's another good indicator to indicate that it's not pre-war which is um uh the knee board in the video for the pilot is censored um which is really only something that happened you know after the start of the war um, so you can you can go back and you can look at all these things and it's a process of of basically going and verifying and, you know, going back and checking satellite imagery, you know, from Sentinel to see that, hey, yeah, this is a general makeup of what spring looks like, you know, from above in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, for I do that basically for every tweet, you know, I'm verifying sources. I'm 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 basically doing the, an extended sniff check of it if I can't do something like actually geolocate where it happened and, and verify mm -hmm. location. Um, and, yeah, there there is a lot of that that goes into, you know, the back end of what I'm doing. Um, and I, I also rely on others. You know, if I make a mistake someone's going to say, hey, that's old footage. Here's where it's from. And, you know, I, I, I have that happen fairly rarely. But when it does, you know, mm -hmm. I'm very thankful for people who fact check me. You know, if someone's fact checking me, I don't get angry. I'm really happy because they're doing a bunch right. of free work for me there um, and, and ensuring that, that I'm sharing the best possible information and, and the best 
or the most accurate version of the story of what's happening. Um, and yeah, the, the, the backend work isn't, isn't minor in what I do. Yeah. So, I mean, you got a lot of cool stuff in your account and everything from, you know, here's Russian military capabilities to Ukrainian military capabilities and things like that. You had one tweet, uh, post that I wanted to ch chat a bit about. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, let's see if this actually works. Uh, this one, this one, this one, there we go. Uh, let me know if you can see that. <laughs> More, more yeah it's been it's been a bit since i posted commentary <laughs> like that yeah so i i was really intrigued by this because i'm an isr person my background is in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance for those that don't know what isr is um and you know i think we've learned a lot about russia going uh into ukraine here um but I, th I found this as an interesting thought now i was hoping you could maybe talk us through it a little bit for the people that are listening i'm going to read this to you uh, or at least the first part, and then we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So it says, uh, as a side note here, both at the resource and organizational level, Russian ISR is poor. There's a fairly high likelihood that Russian command only has a rough idea of what is actually going on at the front line, and even poor idea of what's going on behind the front. And then you substantiate that with, with some more information. Um, I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit, about the Russian capabilities not just in isr but um you know their communication and things like that like what if we really learned about russia in terms of capability um uh, going into this yeah so historically late cold war let's say late 80s russian capabilities to actually understand what was happening you know both behind the front line and near the front line was was pretty close to on par with with U.S. capabilities or NATO capabilities in general. Um, since then, Russia has fallen behind. Um, I, I I'll put it this way: the Russians operate uh, actually after after combat or related accidents. The Russians operate like two IL twenty two PPs, which are um, mm -hmm. their larger, you know, theater strategic based um, electronic signals intelligence aircraft. Um, and those can only be in, you know, limited places at any one time, collecting a very limited amount of information and can't go that far, you know, or that close to the front. Um, Russian frontal reconnaissance aviation is next to non-existent now. They used to have a mm. fairly good fleet of Su-22 MRs, um, which were sort of modernized reconnaissance aircraft um, built to, you know, go in at low level and take a picture of something that, you know, they wanted to hit later um, right. or go take a look at something. Um, they've retired their entire fleet of, um, of MiG-25 based reconnaissance aircraft, which had side looking airborne radar um, that could, that could actually, you know, take a look at the ground and, you know, track units moving around. All of that's gone. All of that's been retired. That's gone away or has been significantly depreciated into, you know, basically disuse. Um, Whereas the Ukrainians have access to a massive amount of commercial satellite data that's being paid for by the United States. We've been very public in our um, aid package mm -hmm. announcements that we're providing that to them. Um, and the Ukrainians also have some, some native uh, reconnaissance solutions and, and that, they, that they utilize. Um, additionally, that's, that's just the resource. That's, you know, the Russians have terrible resources that they can utilize to actually get a look of what's happening. Um, right. But at the organizational level, there are also issues. No one gets rewarded in Russia for telling the truth um, if the truth is bad. And during this war, the truth has very frequently not been great for the Russians um, outside of, you know, southern Ukraine. But even that's going wrong for them now. Um, I really do think that in in the russian intelligence community or or in the russian military you know as a whole you aren't rewarded for for telling the correct assessment of the situation you may distort it a bit you may make it seem like it's you know going a bit better than it is and so that slowly you know at each level you know each individual person reporting up the chain is going to make it seem a bit better until the eventual picture that the commander gets is completely not in accordance with reality. And so when I say mm -hmm. that at the organizational level, Russia has 
very little idea of what's happening at the at the actual front line or or a degraded idea of what's happening at the front line um it, it's because everyone's lying to each other and and no one no one really wants that that idea and so when the mill bloggers you know those those russian mm-hmm. not state associated you know channels but but obviously guys with you know some contact with with russian command and and with you know individual russian soldiers on the ground are are panicking you know at every single ukrainian tank driving around in in kharkiv oblast um that's because they they probably don't have the greatest idea of where those tanks are going or even where the tanks are um and so there is that idea that that the russians may not exactly have the greatest ability to actually counter a Ukrainian counteroffensive because, you know, they don't know where to assign troops. It, it sounds like uh, an entire military that literally shoots the messenger. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you bring bad news, oh, bye-bye. Um, yeah. And, and that's, it has... That's not it, good. Yeah, and it has actually impacted their their capabilities to really degrade the Ukrainian military. Uh, in the first two weeks of the war, mm-hmm. the Russians were constantly hitting, you know, Ukrainian barracks, command centers, um, right. uh, airfields, areas where there were actually Ukrainian troop concentrations. That's almost certainly because they had built up data on that. The second mm-hmm. the Ukrainians actually went to the ground and got responsive and distributed and dispersed their operations to you know remote sites the russians completely lost their picture and capabilities to actually you know reach out and strike them with their platforms which is why they switched over to targeting other things that they had long term information on like infrastructure which are hard targets that don't exactly frequently move around um so that's that that's one of the biggest signifiers that they actually were you know that their their limited capabilities have been hurting them so you always think about in in military history about the way Russians approach warfare, right? Which is, they're just going to throw more bodies at it. You know, um, there was a great movie back in the day about the, the snipers that fought each other and they literally had people, you know, firing it at them from the front and the back. Right. So it's like, you had to go into well, war. That's, uh, no uh, that's, is, that's is that, kind of a misconception is that still what actually. Doing? No, okay. because during world war two, the Russians were actually, you know, they got pretty confident with what they were doing. They were, you know, as they were driving mm-hmm. the Germans back, this was not conscript rush base. They were they were conducting fairly um, complex maneuver warfare. You know, they 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 got past the you know having the single radio for the commander just to talk to you know the other commander mm-hmm. to tell him where to go. Um, and and they were conducting pretty complex operations. Um, even even during the Cold War, the Russian military really was built, or or the the the. Warsaw Pact was really built to conduct fairly complex operations, you know, utilizing thousands of aircraft working together and, you know, eventually by the late 80s, also incorporating airborne early warning assets um, and and various extremely advanced for the time um, reconnaissance assets. And so this 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 really is honestly as as stereotypical as it might seem you know from the from the limited or the the very big focus on events that happened in stalingrad basically um Mm -hmm. but the russian military has kind of been forced into this due to um i mean systematic both corruption and lack of investment since the end of the cold war so so how would you describe their strategy at this point then um everyone is fighting with each other in high command (laughs) That's that's how I would describe that. I mean, when you see, you know, the head of Wagner basically going after the Russian commanders um, mm-hmm. in in the area um, and, and what it seems like is that um, there isn't really the coordination between Wagner and the conventional Russian army. Um, and so you'll see, you know, the Russian army operates in this one area, Wagner operates in the other area, and they don't really talk to each other about what they're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if the Russian army gets pushed back in one area, um, you know, someone will go on Telegram and start yelling about it because, you know, oh, they betrayed us. And, and, you know, this is all Shoigu's fault and and something's gone wrong. And Gerasimov is, you know, going to make sure we don't get our ammunition. Um, And really, it, it is sort of this breakdown among that area of the front. Southern, you know, the southern part of Ukraine, you know, Kherson Oblast. Um, it's a bit of a different story. They they actually are a bit more competent and actually well put together. 
um, with what they've been able to do. But in Eastern mm-hmm. Ukraine, it is it is really a, a, a story of dysfunction, um, of of relying on on conscripts through Wagner to push through Ukrainian lines, um, sort of utilizing those those infantry wave tactics. Well, maybe the Russian army will use a bit more strategy per se because they're working mm-hmm. on more open ground. Um, but they they really are relying on Wagner to to just be a blunt force instrument. Uh, in that respect, uh, in terms of sheer number of humans, right? Russia has Ukraine outnumbered big time. Um, how how does Ukraine like it? Just from what you've seen, um, how do they approach this uh, tactically? Right? Like what are what are their, the tactical things that Ukraine is doing well? Um, that maybe Russia wasn't expecting or things that you're seeing that like, Oh, that was, that was pretty smart. Like what are those, those tactical um, strategies that they're using? Yeah. Well, so the first day of the Russian invasion, the Ukrainians declared general mobilization. Ukraine actually is a pretty big population. I mean, 44 million people, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not Russia size, but you know, it isn't like off by a factor of 10. Um and what their general mobilization allowed them to do, which is what Russia still hasn't done, um, is put probably, you know, two million people in uniform, um, which is a significant advantage over Russia um, without Russia declaring any sort of general mobilization. So day one, they did the right thing. They put their war reserves into uniform and started training them and getting them ready for more complex operations huge asset for them was the available manpower they had. Um, the other big thing that they've had is um, foreign donations of equipment that is really backstopped them and allowed them to, mm-hmm. you know, Ukraine is supplying the manpower, the individuals to defend their country. Um, while the West is supplying a lot of underlying technology, equipment um, and ammunition and other resources to, to conduct warfare. Um, and enable them to to you know actually utilize their manpower. Um, and the Ukrainians have been, I, I'll say this, Ukrainian commanders are significantly better than Russian commanders. I, I very rarely say that there's like a qualitative difference between individuals on both sides of the field because frankly, we're all humans and the delta isn't gonna be that huge. On the Ukrainian side, it seems to be a a fairly significant difference. Um, that's primarily because post-2014, the Ukrainian armed forces moved much more towards a merit-based system of, of actually Mm -hmm. doing things like encouraging, uh, uh, actual good education for their officers, um, and, and developing a a reasonable NCO corps, which, which they have done, um, with a lot of the regular troop movements, um, into, into the, the frontal area in, in, in the Donbass, um, and on top of that, they were sort of able to develop these underlying bones of a military that could absorb large expansion, which is what they were forced to do last year. Um, now, on top of that, general command has been very responsive to the needs seen on the ground. Um, they've been able to properly utilize Western supplied resources to conduct operations. They haven't just been mm-hmm. wasting what they have. They've, they've been very judicious with their supplies and, and, you know, apart from maybe one or two questionable decisions that, that worked out for them. I I would say that um, it, in general, the, the upper level command has been able to properly conduct operations deep into Russian held territory. And, and, you know, as, as we saw in Kherson or sorry, as we saw in Kharkiv, um, they were able to properly understand Russian force positioning, take advantage of it, and conduct a beautiful counteroffensive um, mm-hmm. that that was able to work around existing roadblocks and obstacles to you know achieve an objectively amazing outcome. Um, whereas the Russians are kind of mired in everyone fighting each other and you know questionable tactical decisions, at least outside of the South. Um, I think those are those are kind of the big advantages that the Ukrainians have right now. Moving into the future, of course, you know, they have a manpower advantage. They don't necessarily have an equipment advantage, but they do have right. um, some qualitative 
um, advantages in the type of support that they're getting. So I've noticed that you really seem to kind of know your equipment, which is awesome. Um, as a former imagery analyst that was trained to tactically identify things from satellite imagery, I, I, I love the fact that you really know your equipment. Uh, may I get your thoughts on that? Like, has, has there been any one or two pieces of equipment that have really shifted the, the tide of war here? Or anything, any major gaps in equipment that would uh, make a huge difference for uh, Ukraine? Yeah, I think everyone wants to wants there to be that one system that will, you know, change everything in Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think there ever has been that one system. And I don't think there ever will be that objective one system. Um, what there has been, though, is there have been systems given that have significantly increased Ukrainian capabilities um, to go and do something. HIMARS, back last year, was mm -hmm. able to force the to it enabled the ukrainians to force the russians to push their ammunition dumps far behind the front lines and push all their supply and resources to a place where it was hard for them to get their supplies to the front um in in the you know intervening month period before the russians were able to do that you had russian ammunition dumps blowing up all over the place um and the ukrainians significantly degraded their capability in one area um you know, as we saw with providing them, or as as we probably will see, providing them with a bunch of mechanized equipment to to refit multiple brigades, um, that was a, a pretty big asset for them. Just as as we've seen from training alone, they've been able to properly equip some some uh, units and and allow them to in the future conduct these operations. Um, you know, everyone wants to give Ukraine attackums. Um, but there there are debates over potential escalation there, and the Ukrainians mm -hmm. have proven to be fairly resourceful um, with the limited supplies they have. Obviously, conducting drone operations um, has been a pretty big one for them to, you know, target Russian oil infrastructure, um, which can degrade further Russian capabilities to actually conduct operations. That's that's one of their things where they they come up with a solution. It's introduced, it degrades Russian capabilities, and Russian capabilities, which have then been degraded, are, are worse on the battlefield. Um, and it's it's kind of this steady march towards turning the Russian army from what it was in the beginning of 2022 to what it is now, which is a significantly degraded fighting force that has reduced capabilities to actually conduct operations and spends, mm -hmm. you know, six months basically throwing people at a city in eastern Ukraine and now they're being forced to retreat. So it, it's it's the steady stacking of capabilities that the Ukrainians have either self-generated or have been given to degrade the Russians slowly. We're ba they're basically chipping away at the Russian ability to conduct war, um, which I think is the big thing to remember, is that it requires this steady supply of capabilities to actually right. put the Russians in a position where they can be effectively thrown out of Ukraine. Has there been anything that's been kind of surprising along that line um, of capability? Oh, I would say HIMARS, absolutely. Like, HIMARS? Could, could, initially, maybe, could you maybe HIMARS... ex explain for people that don't know what HIMARS is? Could you maybe... Um, <laughs> it's, it, it is, it, in essence, uh, the abil it, it, it is, I just go back to capabilities. It is. It, it gives the Ukrainians the capability to park a truck somewhere and make something, you know, 80 or 90 kilometers blow up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, it is it, it is effectively something that makes it so the russians cannot put a high valued asset within 60 kilometers of the front line because it will most likely get a number of large missiles thrown at it um in in some length of time um and and HIMARS, you know is is an incredibly it is a mobile um rocket launch system um and which has allowed the Ukrainians to actually not lose any yet um, for from Russian uh, 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 strikes, which has been a, a huge asset for them at, at the same time as so it's been able to degrade the Russian capabilities and Russian assets. So uh, I brought up the wiki for HIMARS, um, which I'm familiar with it, but for the people that don't know, it's a, like, like you mentioned, a um, truck mounted missile system that says carries one pod with either six uh six rockets or one 
uh, missile. So they got some crazy acronyms here on these missiles. Just know it's got it's got massive capability to reach uh, deep into uh, territory. So that's uh, interesting to see. Um, the M142 HIMARS, cool stuff. Um, anything else? Uh, you, you mentioned drones. Um, as a drone person myself, um, I think it's interesting that what you're seeing a lot of times is uh, the Ukrainians using a DJI drone and the Russians using a DJI drone and they're fighting it out uh, with these Chinese drones. Um, what are your thoughts on just the, the basic use of drones? And obviously from your perspective, you probably get some great video from, <laughs> from those uh, and things like that that you get to share. Um, what are your just general thoughts on the use of drones in this, in this war? Yeah, so drones have immensely evolved um, since the start of the conflict. Um, I mean, early there were examples of these these very early sort of utilization of drone dropped munitions back when ISIS was still a problem, in especially in Mosul. Right. Um, there would be Russians or not Russians, sorry, <laughs> ISIL, ISIL fighters mm -hmm. flying around, you know, DJI phantoms, very early DJI drones, um, dropping oh, yeah. single grenades on onto coalition forces. Um, and that that was an early thing. It didn't really evolve basically from then to Ukraine just because there there wasn't as much interest at, in it as as ISIS really stopped being as much of an issue. Um but early Ukrainian efforts to actually implement, uh, you know, basically people were running around during the invasion of Kiev with their with their own drone and basically going to a unit and say, hey, I have a drone. Let me support your, your you know, your artillery battery. Let me let me support your right, attached right. artillery by <laughs> flying around and, and spotting targets and and giving them GPS coordinates <laughs> of where to shoot at um, and, and sending them videos of of what, you know, is behind the front. Mm -hmm. Um and that's something that that really started off and and kickstarted everyone's ideas of how to use drones in 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 warfare, in, especially in Ukraine. Um, and that slowly got developed further and further and further um, until eventually, you know, by the end of of the engagement around Kiev, um, Ukrainian forces had started to really figure out that you know hey, we can basically just attach small grenades to, you know, our Mavics and we're going to be flying over the Russian position looking at them anyway. How about we drop a grenade on them at the same time? Um, That's wild. And there, there was that realization and sort of that learned communal knowledge um, within the Ukrainian armed forces because, frankly, and the one great thing that Ukrainian armed forces has going for them is everyone tends to talk to each other. Um, right. And so if one person learns that, hey, you know, there's a 3D printed file that I have that, you know, can, you can attach it on a drone and use, you know, X, Y, and Z to, to drop a grenade. Um, I'm going to share that with everyone I know. And they're going to share that with everyone they know. And suddenly within a few weeks, everyone is using, you know, everyone's attaching mm -hmm. grenades to their drones and flying them out and dropping them on Russians. Um, and I think that that sort of communal capability was evolved quickly for them. Um, it is one of those, you know, warfare drives invention very quickly. Um, and then on top of that, you saw this extremely sudden, at least, uh, driven by a few different projects, uh, use of FPV uh, loitering munitions. There's one right. fairly famous video from about five years ago um, in, in Ukraine of a, uh, 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 of a Ukrainian FPV drone that was unarmed. Uh, flying out and harassing a Russian or not a, well, a <laughs> Russian separatist position, um, basically just flying through their trench and annoying them and harassing them. And I think there was kind of a realization a few months ago that, wait a second, we can build a drone that is, you know, a racing drone that's powerful enough to lift, you know, either an RKG heat grenade, which is basically just a really big grenade, um, or a, a, basically an RPG warhead. Um, and go fly it into something and it's going to explode. and It's going to really hurt. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there are a few proof of concepts there um, that had been shared on Telegram. And then the Escadron project was launched and that really got into, you know, churning out, frankly, hundreds of these FPV loitering munitions. And they've been they've been moving to the front pretty, pretty regularly now. And we're seeing obviously a lot of videos of basically what are what are in a way almost improvised javelins of of being able to put a heat warhead into the top of an enemy tank um or enemy you know armored fighting vehicle or enemy position um 
and and I think that's going to continue as drones kind of steadily evolve in this environment. Um, obviously, there have been efforts to down enemy drones with with jamming systems, but mm -hmm. the problem with that is uh, unfortunately the inverse square law, which means that you you can't exactly jam the entire front. Um, you 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 don't have enough jammers. Either side doesn't have enough jammers to actually deny the entire front line to drones. And you you'll figure out quickly where there aren't jammers because suddenly you can fly your drone around and you know mm -hmm. actually go and drop a grenade on the Russians. Yeah, it's like Swiss cheese, right? It's only a matter of time before the yeah someone's find gonna hole. find a hole. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Uh, well, in your estimation, you know, I know no one can predict the future, but I'm sure you maybe talk about this. Um, where is where is this where's Ukraine at in ten years? You know, um, probably in the EU. Um, depending on what happens, maybe in NATO, maybe not in NATO, but almost certainly in the EU. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's going to be some sort of agreement with the Russians. Um, the Ukrainians have obviously made it clear that they intend to recover all territory, um, previously taken by the Russians. Mm -hmm. Um, so that'd be Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea. Um, and of course the, the other oblasts, which the Russians have just invaded and annexed. Um, the Russian response to that is going to be interesting. Russia basic Russia basically has two routes right now and I'll, 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 or technically three, but I don't like considering the third route because it's not great for anyone. Um, oh boy. well, <laughs> obviously, you know, it's, we it's can the guess nuclear. what the third route is. <laughs> it's, it's the nuclear option, which, you know, right. I don't think anyone's crazy enough within Russia to actually go through with that. But, you know, if I'm wrong, haha, good luck trying to yell at me then. Um, right. but I, I, I think they do have these two options, which is either realize that the Ukrainians are not going to roll over ever. And that there is there's no reasonable option in which the Russians are able to retain the territory they currently have. And they realize that they mm -hmm. need to get, negotiate and they take, you know, some sort of negotiated position where they they effectively end up losing most of the territory because that's the only one where the Ukrainians are actually willing to negotiate on. Um, and the other one is Russia goes through general mobilization um, and they continue to churn through their own population, basically throwing them at Ukraine. Um, and that one has further two options, which it's basically things grind down in the East until it's basically trench warfare, um, with Russians basically just throwing people at the problem and the Ukrainians not willing to commit enough resources or not able to commit enough resources to basically just run over them. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, they're able, they were able to conduct the operation in Kharkiv because there just weren't many Russians around and they were able to, to mm -hmm. move and, and move quickly without sustaining losses. Um, and then there's the, the, the end option there, which is, it just turns into a slog um, for, for the next decade um, where, where you'll effectively see a repeat of 2014, except more, you know, more high intensity environment um, where effectively Eastern Ukraine is, um, just a, a sort of a constant war zone and continues to be so um i i i that is probably the worst option because it's just the most violent and sad one um mm -hmm. and then the other option that ends from general mobilization is eventually the russian people realize that they are being just abused at this point and that their leadership will constantly just throw them into what is effectively a wood chipper in Eastern Ukraine. And, and there is, there's no real option there. And eventually the, the, there's only so much that the Russian people will take on that. And, and they'll do right. something where they'll either make it impossible for the Russians to continue fighting um, where you'll just see units start to mutiny, which frankly, we're, we're getting close to that with Wagner at this point. <laughs> um, but, but you, you will see increased civil issues within Russia that will, kind of force them to to go back mm -hmm. to one of the other options yeah i wanted to ask you about about russia in particular you, you track a lot of the russian bloggers and things like that um i i don't get how that entire population could just think that this this is okay right like at some point uh, aren't they gonna be like huh maybe we maybe we're the bad guys here you know 
is the propaganda ever... machine that good coming from Putin that they just don't they don't realize it or or do they not care or what I mean what what is it to for the Russian population like what what is their perspective on this um and I know it's hard to I'm sure different people have different perspectives but in a general sense what would you say their perspective on this is and and why are they okay with this why are they okay with just flo- throwing bodies at the the eastern portion of Ukraine I'm sure at a certain point they don't want to lose their sons yeah i mean i'm not a russia expert by by mm-hmm. any means i i i have you know i know russians i've talked with them i you know i i had russian friends who actively supported the invasion um wow what, what was their reason for supporting the invasion like was it... It, it's really cultural there is there is a mm-hmm. cultural belief that the people in eastern ukraine who were russian and now who they fully mm-hmm. believe are russian citizens were being okay. abused by their, you know, the Ukrainians. They were being genocided. The Ukrainians are a bunch of Nazis, and they will, you know, if they ever retake Donetsk, they'll basically kill everyone who ever supported Ukraine or whoever supported Russia. Um, and that's ingrained as well. And there's some underlying belief in, you know, if we return to this old Soviet Union where we have Ukraine, we have this breadbasket, we have mm-hmm. this, you know fairly technologically advanced country with with a fairly large number of resources and access to the black sea you know we'll be in a great position again and we'll be able to rival europe um i think there's a bit of existential angst about the positioning of russia of we are you know we kind Mm -hmm. of wasted our chance to liberalize and so we might as well go you know full into this 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 recreation of the soviet union because we're we're not it's not getting better if we don't um that's that's some of the underlying cultural stuff um and they're they're right now most of what the russians are saying if they're complaining about it it's the special military operation was a great idea it's what we had to do it was necessary but the commanders were incompetent and you know mm-hmm. wasted it for us there there is no realization that what they did was wrong it's just x y and z you know Shoigu, Gerasimov, they all screwed it up. You know, they're a bunch of morons and then, you know, we should replace them with someone who actually can complete the operation and take Kiev and, you know, secure our, mm-hmm. our new areas in, in Ukraine. Um, and, and the annexation of the territories was, was kind of that huge step is they now really view those people in, you know, Kherson, in Mykolaiv and, you know, Donetsk and Luhansk as Russian citizens, as full Russians. Hmm. Um, and they, they view it as Russian territory as, you know, if Ukraine were to, you know, take an offensive and, you know, go all the way down to, um, Mariupol and take it again and, you know, take, take the Southern part of Ukraine, the Russians would view that as an invasion of Russia at this point. Um, or at least a lot of them would. Um, and so now you really have this cultural or at least believed cultural connection between, um, Russians in Russia proper and what they view as their new Russian territory. Um, and I, even if you look at individuals who've been directly impacted by the war, who's ha- who've had, you mm-hmm. know, who've had sons, fathers, you know, brothers die. Um, and if you talk to them and so many of them, even in like, you know, the, the military spouse groups on, on, you know, on BK on Russian social media, they still support the war. Like, even if they've had a loved one die, even if they've been so directly, immensely impacted by it, and they now just have, you know, it it, almost in a horrifying way, the sunk cost fallacy of, you know, I believe that my, you know, brother, son, husband, you know, fought and died for the motherland, you know, they, they, they fought for greater Russia. Um, There's sort of that, that radicalization in a way. Um, And I think we'll continue to see that until, you know, there's a realization of hopelessness basically of, you know, Mm -hmm. we are, we're doing something with no progress. And, you know, if the Russians aren't able to, to retain any territory and continue to lose that, that might happen in the, at some point. Um, But I think if the Russians can position themselves as we're defending our territory, you know, our, our, our homeland, you know, these, these new acquisitions of, of our, of, of the Russian people, um, I really don't think we'll see that breakdown in the environment around it. You know, maybe if the Russians start to suffer more, 
from sanctions, possibly. Um, but I just don't see that happening in the near future. Yeah, it's almost uh, a war on two for Russia. It's a it's a war on two fronts, right? They have to um, get their population aligned with with uh, what they're doing uh, at the same time while they're fighting Ukraine. I think Ukraine has an advantage in this regard because no one in Ukraine's questioning what's going on. You know why why their uh, sons and daughters are dying uh, because they're they're trying to defend their territory. They're fighting for something, whereas the Russians don't seem to be fighting for anything. They're just fighting against the Nazis uh, of the Ukrainians, from what I can tell. Um, I think I have a, I, I struggle from this from from my perspective. I just scratch my head. I don't quite understand what Russia uh, gets out of this, other than some land, um, a depleted military, and. A, a hot mess of a stance on any issue in the world, right? I mean, who's going to go to Russia for anything now? Now, you know, they have all these sanctions against them. It's basically, do you, do you think that it could be, and I, and I hope that this isn't the case, um, a, a mechanism that further ties Russia to China, to Iran, um, to, to push towards that, that direction of a, of a world war. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying I'm not predicting World War Three here. What I'm saying is, do you think that the war in Ukraine kind of forces Russia to side more tightly with China and China with Russia? That could be a prelude to a much larger um, event. I mean, uh, China has its own regional focuses that mm -hmm. aren't really in line with Russia. Um, they have their own concerns that right now. Mm -hmm. Russia, I mean, sure, if they... Russia just doesn't have much it can offer to China um, right now. Hmm. It, it, it has, you know, potentially a fuel supply, but they aren't actually connected by any pipelines to China. Um, and, and any pipelines will take more than, you know, 10 years to actually finish. Um, and, and Russian oil extraction capabilities are, are kind of down at the moment. Um historically Russia and China or Russia and China after the Sino-Soviet split haven't had the greatest relations. Um, and you, you, even, we've even seen that, you know, now is that China has not directly supported Russia in the war. Um, they've, if anything, they've, they've supported Ukraine and, and Russia about the same with commercial exports. Mm -hmm. Um, Ukraine right. is using a bunch of Chinese drones and Russia is using a bunch of Chinese drones. They're, they're both using that. Um, Whereas Iran over on the other end of the spectrum is much more incorporated into the, the, the Russian coalition um, mm -hmm. of, you know, basically Belarus, Russia, and Iran, which is such a great combination of countries at, at the end of the day. Jeez. Um, but Iran is obviously getting something more solid out of it. They're getting technology transferred. They're getting, you know, mm -hmm. a, you know, a supposed supply of SU 35s potentially, um, based on based on based on some reporting um whereas china doesn't really need that they have their own domestic aircraft industry that's that's fairly advanced right now they they're actually able to mass produce a, a fifth generation fighter in the j20 whereas russia mm. can't really mass produce the su-57 um you, you you see you know there's there's less of a reliance on russia for those resources and and china really has its own area that it wants to focus on i mean sure they they've been incorporating with the russian pacific fleet but the russian pacific fleet has been significantly degraded because you'll most likely see one of the slava class cruisers go to replace the moskva um in mm -hmm. in capability and either remaining the mediterranean or or main you know going back to the black sea at some point um and you know russian russian naval capabilities have just continually degraded um and you'll you'll see that cross operation, but frankly, Chinese naval capabilities in the Pacific are so far ahead of Russian naval capabilities that it it, it matters a bit less. Um, it, 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 I I don't see that axis being being one that gets developed much if it does. Um, whereas I think the Iran Russia one is is far more concerning, and in, in what Iran may be getting 
out of their their frankly massive support for Russia in you mm-hmm. know with drones with other technologies with you know I mean the Russians are using Iranian body armor at this point um it's it's the the, mm. the total amount of resources transferred from from Iran to Russia indicates that there is something coming back in exchange are there in in all the your research are you seeing any any other countries involved on the ground other than Russia and Ukraine and whoever Wagner group <laughs> hires not really not not no. no one no one else is really I, I mean if you look at it what countries would be willing to actually stick their neck out for Russia risk massive sanctions and mm-hmm go on the side of the losing team like it's if russia were winning i'm willing to bet we would see much more support from them from you know countries who are more aligned in that sphere but no Mm -hmm. one really wants to be on the side of the loser at the end of the day well i mean what makes you so certain that they're going to lose um i don't really see an avenue for them to objectively win that's that's the thing i mean it's it's you know what what is winning and losing if if we want to actually attempt right. to define that which is <laughs> frankly we'd be we'd be sitting here for the next 5 hours but at, at this point russian the original russian intentions of the invasion were to you know decapitate the the right. the regime in kiev um institute some sort of regime change to a more friendly power um and they no longer have that they they have a a country that is you know integrating further and further with nato integrating further and further with europe as as a whole and you know starting to gain some capabilities that are that are really threatening them i mean storm shadow um mm-hmm. it is a significant upgrade in ukrainian capabilities that they did not have before the war that they have today um that they are now able to reach fairly deep into Russia and conduct strikes. And, and frankly, with the, with the, what, whatever Russian air defense is doing, they've obviously proven that they can conduct those strikes. Um, can, can you, can you talk about storm shadow? I mean, other than being a really cool GI Joe character. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool. That's cool. cool snake eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a long, hey, I, a long I, range. I, missile. I like the snake eye, darn it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it is, it is a, a long range stealthy cruise missile um that that's probably okay. going to get in incre- integrated onto the the ukrainian su-24 fleet which is pretty small but still capable um and it gives the ukrainians the ability to reach it, it's also pretty stealthy so it, it gives the ukrainians the ability to reach behind the russian front lines and, and continuing mm-hmm. to go deeper and deeper into russia where you know they can they can probably conduct reasonable strikes hundreds of miles into russian territory um where, where they they have this capability to actually then and go basically blow up whatever they want to that's reasonably right. involved in in the war um which is capability they did not have before the war and they have now and that's a that's a big loss for the russians to be honest those uh, storm shadow missiles who who supplied those that would be the uk that is a that U- is a UK. joint yeah okay. that is a joint uk french weapon okay that's interesting uh were you tracking the news of this drone that got shot over the Kremlin uh, not too long ago? What what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think it's a false flag. I I mm-hmm. I do not believe the Russians would decide to, you know, hit the Kremlin and make themselves look like massive morons with no real response. I mean, their right. their response was launching what 12, 13 cruise missiles into Ukraine, and pretty much all of them got shot down um right. so so it, it 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 wasn't a pretext to some sort of larger operation um it 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 made them look like you know a pack of incompetence in in moscow with you know whatever air i mean they'd been sticking you know pantsiers you know sam systems on the top of a bunch of buildings in moscow and they weren't able to shoot mm-hmm. down you know a couple of fairly slow moving drones right. um and and you know it was a statement it was right before you know victory day it was it was right before you know the russians were going to roll out their very limited parade and it it just made them look bad yeah what was up with that their their victory day parade uh i've seen various reports i i i saw one that was kind of interesting i don't know who the who this was this representative in russia um, who said that they were using advanced camouflage? And that's why you didn't see all of their their fleet of uh, military vehicles because they were they were camouflaged. 
um, their victory day parade was like pittance. It was like nothing. It was like all the all their equipment they usually show off. They had almost nothing out there. Uh, yeah, I thought that was I mean, pretty crazy. I think the the enduring message, like if you were to have a tagline of of mm-hmm. victory of the victory day parade, it would have been extremism. Um, <laughs> well, no, and and here's here's the end end of that. If you look at like the vehicles involved, it was three road mobile ICBMs, mm-hmm. a bunch of trucks donated from the Chechens, um, from okay. from Katarov's guys. Um, and a <laughs> few other vehicles and, and an S 400 battery oh, and some Iskanders as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a bunch of nukes, uh, some Chechens running around in central Moscow and, you know, the equipment to protect said nukes and Chechens. Um, and so if, if you look at that, that is, that is kind of where that Russian state is going right now. It's their, it's their fallback. It is, it is we will, you know, continue to hold this nuclear sort of Damocles over everyone and make it so, you know, we can't mm-hmm. be properly beaten on the battlefield because we'll just, you know, take our toys and go home and ruin it for everyone else. Um, and I, I, I think that is something to remember that the Russian state is really relying on that nuclear threat to to mm-hmm. retain conventional combat power. I, th- I thought it was hilarious, man. I was, I was looking at their equipment. I was like... Ooh, that's that's that was not a good sign. In a scary way. It was like a toddler with a knife. It, like you would think you'd think they would just cancel it. Be like, ah, we're not doing it this year. We're we're too busy, you know, uh, fighting Nazis. Um, I thought I thought that was insane. Um, so you're you're sharing a lot of a lot of information. A lot of it's um just just raw information. Uh, I think it's safe to say you're pro Ukraine. I think that's pretty pretty safe to say. Um. Are you afraid of being personally targeted with either violence or lawsuits or things like that? What the Russians are going to sue me? <laughs> well, I mean... no, uh, maybe, m- maybe I don't, I don't know, but um, you know, their uh, money goes a long way, right? And they can they can use money to leverage uh, companies to sue or something like that. I don't know. I'm just saying I mean, that when I... you put when you put yourself out there and you're sharing um things and you have a lot a ton of followers like do you think about that at all like are you are you afraid that you know wake up there's gonna be some russian mafia guy at your door i mean it's a consideration but you know to, mm-hmm. to not not be stereotypical or anything you know if we stop posting the terrorists win darn it um <laughs> right but i you know i i do think obviously the fact that that is a consideration obviously says something about russia you know as mm-hmm. as a country um Typically, they have targeted outside of Russia Russian citizens who have left mm. Russia. They, they, it is you know Russian belief that they are able to you know exact some sort of law or you know demonstration of power upon their own citizens, no matter where they be. Um, whether there be collateral damage to that, you know, uh, you know, with Novichok in in London. Um, mm-hmm that's less of a concern for them. You know, if, if they accidentally, you know, poison someone else in the process, so be it, they got who they wanted. Um, I, I, I think that in general, um, that is, that is, that is their targeted area. They, but they, they will, if you are a Russian dissident outside of Russia, you face those huge issues. Um, you, you mm-hmm. face that potential of the Russians coming after you. Uh, well, I think what you're doing is awesome. Um, are there are there any other Twitter OSINT accounts or maybe some other accounts on other platforms, not necessarily Twitter, um, that people should look at? Some other awesome OSINT stuff? Oh, oh boy. Um, I would say, and and this is probably the easiest way to do it, anyone just start with who I follow. That's a that's a, that's a, that's a great resource on Twitter. You can see who everyone follows. Um, and kind of just go down the rabbit hole from there, you know. If there's an account that that I follow, they're they're probably doing something interesting. Um, you know, click on them, see who they follow. They're probably also following people who are doing interesting things. And you know, without getting into the telephone game, that's that's probably the easiest way to to find and go after those people. Um, I obviously always plug Live UA Map um, just because they are they are really the 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 OGs of of tracking Ukraine in a graphical manner of making making really confusing things understandable. 
Um, you know, I, I, I have to plug Michael Kaufman, who's my colleague at CNA. Um, he's, uh, also very, very good at, at really diving in and providing deeper understanding into the situations um, going on in Ukraine. Um, but apart from that, you know, anyone I follow, you know, I know it's not a, not an endorsement just following someone, but there's a general idea that they they may know right. what they're doing. Yeah, no, that's cool. And we'll, we'll make sure whatever platform you're listening to this on or, or if you're on YouTube watching, uh, we'll make sure the links to the OSINT technical Twitter is in the description. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with this last question. We can we can chat a little bit further about it. Um, what do you what do you want people to know about what you're doing? You know, like um, you've given this some some hard thought here. Uh, uh, when you wake up in the morning, you you, you start digging through da- data and you're sharing out. You have a massive following, and, and that's going to continue to grow. Um, what do you want people to really know about you and to know about what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I'd start off by saying everyone's human, you know, everyone, everyone messes Mm -hmm. up at some point. And, you know, that's, I I think the measure of how someone should be viewed in their work is how they respond to both criticism and, you know, making mistakes. If there's a good response to it, if there's, you know, culpability, if there's, if there's, if there's proper, you know, understanding of, you know, how they messed up, um, that's a great person. They're grade A that is immediately, you know, top of the list. Um, that's, that's really with people, what you should understand. Um, I, generally, I also think OSINT is really still in its or modern day OSINT because OSINT's mm-hmm. existed for a while, but modern day OSINT, the modern day information, you know, sharing environment, um, is really still in its infancy. It's going to keep growing. It's going to keep advancing further and further and further, um, and I, I really do think that it's still underutilized at the moment. There are still a lot of places where it can mm-hmm. be utilized. Um, and, and you know, people will continue to to work forward and, and move forward in utilizing it. Yeah, on the, on the topic of just OSINT in general, I had a, my previous podcast was with um, two gentlemen from a company called Shadow Dragon. And I had the opportunity to see their software and what they can do with just open source intelligence data. And it just, it blew my mind. I mean, you can go, you could start with just the nugget of information and learn basically everything about, <laughs> about someone. Yeah. Um, if there's so many vulnerabilities in these things. And um, for example, I gave, uh, I gave them my phone number. I said, it, you know, and I was actually with a few other people. So I was like, okay, let's see what you can find. Right. I just gave my phone number. That was it. And they were able to find, uh, me, my family, my address, my Facebook profile, my, I mean, just everything about me. Like, you know, I don't, I'm sure maybe some OSINT people want to research me. Go ahead. Uh, I'd be <laughs> curious to see what you find. Um, but I th- I was just blown away by that because it took her like maybe two minutes and uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff. And I definitely recommend anyone that's interested in OSINT uh, watch that podcast. It's called uh, Mastering OSINT. It's on, it's on my YouTube page. Definitely check that out. Um, all the links to all the stuff that we're talking about will be in the description. I'll put the links to some of the people that he's following as well. Um, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. If you're there, it's free. We can continue to make these awesome podcasts. Uh, make sure you leave a five-star review um, on Apple podcast and um, really appreciate you, you coming on and, and talking today. And, and I'm hoping we can continue the conversation. No. And, and, and thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Take care. 